Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Texas Public Policy Foundation for a very special policy primer about the Texas child welfare system. If we've not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Andrew Brown. I have the privilege of serving as Associate Vice President for Policy here at the foundation, and I also oversee our Right for Families campaign. Those of you who have followed our child and family work know that we have strong opinions, to say the least, about how to improve the Texas child protection and foster care systems. And our work is animated by the belief that the relationship between a parent and child is among the most important in all of human history. And the Right for Families campaign at the foundation exists to protect and advance the institution of the family because strong, healthy Texas families are essential for a strong and healthy Texas. Since 2016, the Texas Public Policy Foundation has been instrumental in crafting and advancing reforms for our state's child welfare system that have helped to make it safer and more responsive to the needs of children and focused it in on strengthening rather than separating families. Our success and the success of the foundation as a whole is rooted in the high quality research and actionable policy solutions we produce. But more importantly, I think it's our commitment as a foundation to working well with others, regardless of party, ideology, or even differences of opinion. And our guest today is someone that I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the two years, a little more than two years now, since she was appointed to lead the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. And I've really enjoyed the opportunity to get to work with her. And during that time, we've certainly had very honest conversations and some differences of opinion. But what I think is more important is that we've been able to find common ground on a number of issues. And most importantly, we share a common goal of supporting and strengthening our state's most vulnerable children and their families. Jamie Masters is, as I said, the commissioner of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, a position she's held since she was appointed by Governor Abbott in December 2019. Previously, she served as Chief of Health Services and Acting Chief of Operations for Jackson County, Missouri. She also served as Deputy Secretary of Family Services, Director of Economic and Employment Services for the Kansas Department of Children and Families. Prior to her time with Kansas DCF, Commissioner Masters held several positions with the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas. I said that right? Wyandotte? Ah, Wyandotte County. Um, and she also served on the Kansas Sentencing Commission and Board of Indigent Defense. She received a Bachelor of Science in Human Resource Management and a Master of Science in Marriage and Family Therapy from Friends University in Wichita, Kansas. Please join me in welcoming our guest, Commissioner Jamie Masters. Thank you so much for being here today and agreeing to have this conversation. I've been really looking forward to it since uh, we schemed it out a few weeks ago. Yes. Um, so a lot of what we see in the media and from folks like me obviously focuses a lot on problems. Because you're our guest and we're very hospitable hosts here, I want to give you the opportunity to tell us about what's going right. Thank you. Um, that's not an opportunity I often get, um, and so I appreciate um, you allowing that. I often find myself explaining or defending, and I get that. When something bad happens, we absolutely should be held accountable for that. Um, but I think, I think many would be surprised at how well we are doing. Um, and so if I could. Absolutely, I got my cheat sheet here. All right, um, so Texas investigates at a lower rate of abuse and neglect reports than other states. A lower rate is better because we want those reports screened carefully so that we are not investigating families when we shouldn't be. We ranked 19th in that metric. And this is how, this is federal data for how we compare to other states, I should have said that. Children are removed into foster care in Texas at a rate of two per 1,000 children, a lower rate than the national average. We rank 12th in this measure. We are trying to improve that measure even still, because we should. Children who exit to permanent homes within 12 months, only 3% come back into the system within the next 12 months. Only We, rank, we are 6% nationally. We are at 3%. Only two other states are better than we are at this. Texas has been criticized for the length of time our foster children remain in care, but according to the national, national data, Texas ranks seventh. Only six other states achieve a higher rating than we do. 
another essential measure is how often kids in foster care move around from placement to placement. The data says that the average in Texas is between four and five per 1,000 days, or between one and two moves a year. We rank in the middle of states at 24, and we will continue to push to do better. Our kinship placements have increased dramatically in recent years, and that is a credit to ledge leadership, as well as the hard work put in by CPS statewide. Texas is on par with the national percentage of children placed in kinship, but you and I both know we could do a lot better than we are for kinship placements. While I will state our goal is always zero for abuse and neglect, the public perception is that the Texas foster care system is not only the worst, but the worst in that measure. Our ranking is 23rd, not nearly good enough, but we are better than 28 states and one US territory. And we will continue to prove this, to, to improve this, because the safety of our kids is what our priority is. We have 8,000 less kids in care today than we had at this time last year. That's a big deal. That's excellent. Yeah, absolutely. At this time last year, we had 190 kids without a placement. We're at 75 and putting in as much effort as we can to get those kids into a placement. We have 133 of that 22,000 kids that are placed out of state. Fatalities. Last fiscal year, drownings were down 26%. Unsafe sleep down 30%. Vehicle related deaths down 43%. Physical abuse related deaths down 16%. And our remedial orders for the lawsuit, I'll just give you four but I'll be happy to send you all of them to show you how well that we are doing on the remedial orders for the lawsuit. Please do. So for remedial order five, last fiscal year, 82% of priority one investigations were timely initiated. Remedial order six, 87% of priority two investigations were timely initiated. Remedial order seven, 85% of priority one investigations had timely face-to-face -face contact. And from remedial order eight, 88% of priority two investigations had timely face-to-face. -face. And I fully expect those percentages to be even higher for this fiscal year. That is excellent progress. And I appreciate you giving you know, that perspective on it because it's something we don't often see. Um, and having that information is really critical to influence how we approach like you said, the continued improvement. There are still areas where things aren't good enough and there's more room for improvement and it helps us to focus in on those things. And there's two areas that you brought up that I personally am particularly happy about. The first being uh, the reduction of removals that we're seeing. And over the years, one of the biggest areas that myself and others in the legislature have looked into is how quick DFPS had been to remove kids and place them into foster care. Mm -hmm. What changes have been made internally at DFPS that you think are driving this decrease in removals that we're seeing? So we are we are following the data because we don't want to make assumptions um, and it's early on for that reduction and we want to make sure we give an accurate picture of why that is. There have been some changes. I mean, House Bill 567 definitely changed, you know, non-emergency removals, which is a good thing. Um, I think one of the other changes that I made is I am requiring our leadership in the regions to staff any removal of a child 12 or over. Children have protective factors at that age. It's not the same as when you're removing a four month old. They, they don't have those same factors. And so we really have to look at what is the reason for that removal? What is the need? Um, is there another way that we can meet that need or can we keep that child safe at home still? Um, and so I think that has also changed. What we see kids 12 and over are the ones that we see without a placement um, are often the ones who the removal reason is for a wrapper reason. And so we've got to do a better job of figuring out how we meet the needs of families so that you don't have to give your child up in order to, to have their needs met. Um, and so I, I think that will make a lot of difference in the kids that are coming into care and i'm also traveling around and meeting with staff and making sure they hear from me directly what's important obviously nothing is more important than keeping kids safe but we have got to value families 
we have to see the child. And if that's not the message that's been sent, that's why I'm meeting with staff myself directly to say, no, this is what will be important. Not numbers, not data. Those are all important, but they don't trump a life. And I think often we get in our, we're just doing our job and we don't actually see that person, that child. And I need everybody to, before you make any decisions, how does this impact? Check all your stuff at the door, check your biases, your immaturities, all of that. How does your decision impact this child? And I hope that's making a difference in how we're doing our job. That's an important cultural shift. Um, at the same time as removals have been going down, you mentioned that fatalities have been going down, mm -hmm. which is huge. And one of the fears that is always voiced by some in the community is if removals go down, well, we're going to have more deaths because mm -hmm. the department isn't surveilling all of these families anymore. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. What do you attribute the decrease in fatalities to? So I would hesitate to ever say that any policy I've put in place or even any law is the reason that we have less fatalities because it's too complicated. It's human beings. And it's, it's hard to really say, this is the reason for this. Um, I am excited that our, our fatalities are down, but I'm, I'm also concerned because there is the thought that abuse and fatalities follow the climate of the culture at the time. And so if that's the case, we have record inflation, we have high fuel costs, and those stressors can sometimes push a family to maybe react in a way they normally wouldn't have. And so it's going to be so important for us in our prevention efforts, in the supports that we have in the community to make sure that families know where to go to get the help that they need and those services are without judgment because if families aren't comfortable seeking those services they won't and then that puts children at risk with the caseload adjustments that have happened as a result of fewer kids coming into the care how are staff being redeployed so for cps it's all hands on deck for cwap every available body is including the executive staff is being asked to work CWAP. And part of that is because our caseworkers are already overworked. They already have a caseload that they're full, and now they have to supervise those children without placement. And that is taking a lot of manpower and a lot of finances to manage those children. And so that's where all of those resources right now are being redeployed. And then also our intakes and our investigations are up. And so everyone, there, there's no one looking for work. And we use a lot of acronyms. Uh, so CWAP oh, is Children Without Placement. I do it all the time. I get, I'm sorry. I get hazed at TPPF <laughs> because I start talking in acronyms so much. Um, a related issue for family advocates like me is what we call hidden foster care. And for those who are unfamiliar with this term, it refers to a practice whereby the department can enter into a voluntary agreement with a family to temporarily place that child with another family member or friends while the family gets services. And while this is an important tool to avoid going into the formal foster care system and avoiding court involvement for that family, um, like anything, there are unforeseen con or unintended consequences of that. And one of the areas that we've focused in on is are these arrangements, can they be coercive? And then with the lack of court oversight, what are the due process implications for families who find themselves um, in one of these types of arrangements? So they've also been decreasing mm -hmm. from what we're seeing in the data. What is the department's approach to um, what I call hidden foster care? And you all have your, very, your other technical terms for that. So I heard loud and clear how members felt about PCSPs. Um, I heard it from both sides of the aisle. And Chair Frank and I have had many conversations, as well as Representative Hull and I have had many conversations about PCSPs. And so we took the initiative to look at how we could change that process. Um, because I, I understand it. I think part of, too, what I heard is they're in a PCSP and then you move on and the family's kind of lingering in that situation. And so all of those arguments made sense to me. 
um, and to what we have tried to do to again value keeping families together is how do we address the risk factors the danger factors that we see still in the home and so an example of, of how we've changed this is we made an intake for a mom who is having a major depressive episode sleeping all day not taking care of her own self and not taking care of her children but she trusts grandma grandma's willing to move into the home to make sure the kids are taken care of and mom's willing to seek treatment and so she's there to help support mom in doing that too and so we don't have to remove the children they can stay there now if if there are situations where grandma's available but she's not willing to move in the home but she is still willing to help then in those cases, we may still use a PCSP, but it is no small thing to involve a family with the courts. And if we can prevent that and work with them in their situation and not pile on expectations, not have them have to figure out how to make visits and dates and all kinds of other appointments that could cause a tailspin, that's what we're going to try to do. But we are being very intentional about how we use those. And I will say, you know, in the house, in the, um, I'm sorry, um, in the house hearing, my numbers didn't compare apples to apples. Um, and, and so the data really should have been, in 2018, there were 4,851 kids, in a, unique kids in a PCSP. In June of 2022, there were 474. And so from June of 2018 of 4,000 plus to June now of 474, we are trying. Clearly succeeding in that bringing those numbers down. Um, as we're talking about policy and practice changes, one of the things that I'm always mindful of in the work that I do is these change with successive administrations. What policy and practice changes are going on at DFPS that you would like to see potentially codified to ensure that they continue on into the future? In relation to PCSPs? In relation to uh, anything we've been discussing so far. So if, if I could, for PCSPs at this point, I can't think of any. And, and the reason why I say that is because when you codify something, then there are pretty tight rules around there. and our workers need to be empowered that when that family is in front of them with unique circumstances that they are able to do what is in the best interest of that family and not be constrained by that and so i think when you change a culture i can't speak to what it was before i came in why our numbers were what they were but as that culture sets up hopefully that just will continue um, at least that's my commitment um, that that will continue when it comes to other statute changes, you know, I, I think there's conversations that definitely need to happen around our wrapper statute. I definitely understand why we have that um, when families are exhausted and and think we can access services that they can't. But the child welfare system was never created to raise children nor to meet the needs of every need that a family. We, we are here to assess safety. We are here to get the family safe, if possible, so the child can go back home and adoption be the last resort. We can't be everything to everyone. And when that's what this system, when you expect that of the system, we won't ever succeed. Um, and so I really think we need to look at what the family's responsibility is when it comes to wrapper. If, if, if we continue with that statute, I think you have to have something built in where families, you come and sit with your child in CWA. You have to attend therapy services with your child. There has to be a plan for your child to leave the system and be reuni reunited with your family. It cannot be, here you go and I'm walking away that abandonment that that child feels. And oftentimes they're not victims of abuse and neglect. The parents have reached their limit and we get that sometimes with behaviors and sometimes with mental health needs. But the answer is not to leave them in the child welfare system. And so I think that more discussion needs to be had about that. 
I want to shift gears a little bit. You mentioned the department can't be everything to everyone, and you know the services and supports families' needs don't always come from government. And one thing that Texas has been doing uh, since 2017 is trying to get greater community involvement um, with the legislature enacting a statute in 2017 that really decentralized the system and gave local communities greater responsibility for caring for and managing the cases of children who come into care of the system. And that new model is called community-based care. It's something that we at the Texas Public Policy Foundation are very much in support of. Uh, what improvements are you seeing from community-based care? So I'm excited about the innovation that I'm seeing from the SSCCs. Um, I'm sorry, These single the, source continuum contract. Yeah. I'm sorry about the, the acronyms. <laughs> um, <laughs> we will uh, translate for each other periodically. Uh, these are the lead nonprofit agencies that run the system for the local community. They're community-based nonprofits that are under contract yeah. with the department. Go ahead. So I think rather than numbers, I'd love to tell you about some of the things that each of them are doing with the children, um, because I think that will have a better impact of sharing the innovative work that they're doing. Um, I'll start with Belong, and one of the programs that they've created is called a Disruption Mitigation Staffing Process. Um, they recently shared that they had a total of 27 youth in the process of placements being disrupted, and they were able to successfully address the needs of 13 of those children right away, and to keep those children in their placement and are they are optimistic that they are going to do that for all 27 of those kids. And this may seem minor, but placement disruption is very traumatic and chaotic for a child and can be for the system in general when you're trying to scramble to respond to the placement that's disrupting and also find another one. And so I think we all could learn from how they have rallied their resources and the community to make sure that they don't have disruptions. Um, for to engage, they've created a wraparound to step down program. And this program is designed to identify youth who are in treatment placements and ready for a lesser restrictive setting. Their clinical team offers targeted case management wraparound services once the youth, youth is identified and moved. Currently to engage is serving 14 youth through this program and five have successfully stepped down into a family like setting. Again, this is how it should happen. When you, you obviously don't want to keep a child in a setting that is too restrictive, but you also don't want to just yank them from one place to the next, which then leads to a disruption. And so how they are approaching this with working with the current placement with the child and where they're going is so important. Um, for OCOK, they have been working very closely with Child Protective Investigations staff in the Tarrant County area to assist with family finding efforts at the time of removal. Again, trying to keep kids with their family is a huge priority for them. Um, additionally, OCOK staff are focusing on children who are ready to successfully discharge from RTC placements and are working with potential step down placements with families that will be trained with specific skill sets, trust based relational intervention to prepare for the arrival of the children in their homes. So I hope you're seeing the pattern of how much emphasis they place on keeping the initial placement and making sure that next move is the right one for the kids. Um, lastly, with St. Francis, they have sustained their efforts toward ongoing foster care and adoption recruitment in their community through their ongoing series, Forever Family with KLBK News. 12 children have been featured for adoption in 2022, they recruited 176 new families, which in itself is huge. But I had the pleasure of spending time with St. Francis in Lubbock and sitting down with their foster families and Andrea's in the room and she was there. They were excited that I was there. I left there filled with so much hope and I was so blessed by what I heard from those foster families. Like they get it. They totally get, they see our families, they value reunification, they are mentoring bio families, they are valuing fathers in their relationship with their kids and pushing back on us to say, you're not doing enough to find family and to find fathers and to make sure these kids go home. And I wish everybody could hear those foster families because they were 
amazing. That is so good to hear. And that cultural change that's happening is critically important. I know, you know, I have friends that will often call me up and be like, hey, we're thinking about doing foster care. Talk to us about it. And the biggest piece of advice I always give them is, yes, you're taking care of this kid, but it's more important that you really mentor and support that family yeah, because absolutely. that kid needs to be with their family. And the fact that they're able to recruit families, like as you say, that get it yeah. is so huge for the future of this system. Absolutely. While we're on the subject of community-based care, as I'm talking to local communities and providers and lawmakers, you know, the pace of implementation is something that's always brought up. And the perception that the rollout has been slow and sometimes overly prescriptive. Uh, what's being done to help speed up that pace of implementation and giving communities you know, greater freedom to design a system that works well for their unique region? So just, I, I need to say one, I, I do not control the rollout any longer. And Holly is here from the transition office. But I will tell you that Trisha and I are working very closely together. We both share the sense of urgency to move CBC forward quickly. Coming from Kansas and talking to people in Florida, we didn't have the phased in approach that we have here. That system was put in place by some very smart people before I came and very good reasons for it. I think we have to look now that it's been tested. We have to get it right as far as the readiness and also the oversight. Both of those states have very clear readiness guidelines, which I think we have here, and also very clear oversight. Because yes, we are asking those SSCCs to step in our shoes. They are us. And, and I, I hope we get to a culture where it's no longer us and them. It is DFPS because they are in our shoes doing this job. And so we are one system. But I'm still ultimately responsible for every child. The state is still ultimately responsible. And so we have to be a partnership. Um, but I think there are a lot of things that we can do um, that Trisha and I agree that can move this along faster. Any examples you could share? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep you on the hot seat, but maybe I should put Holly on the hot seat. When can we expect full statewide implementation? So, Do we have a timeline? You you should hear some information. So I don't want to, this is Trisha's, um, and so I don't want to overstep. Correct. But I do want you to know we are a partnership. We are moving together and going the same direction and share the sense of urgency. And just from the things that I just said, you can see the good work that they're doing. They know their kids, they know their communities. And, and you know, I, when, when I'm in, like for instance, when I'm in San Antonio, it is amazing what the community is willing to do, or when I was in Lubbock, what they are willing to do and, and ready to do to surround those contractors to be successful and to meet the needs of the kids and the families in their communities. And so I am certain this will be successful and we're gonna do everything we can to help make sure it is. Well, something I genuinely appreciate about you, as I mentioned at the top, is your willingness to have conversations you know, with folks like me. We've had some lunches and other meetings that we've gotten pretty honest about the problems that we see and what's going on. All nice. Uh, all very nice. <laughs> The food is always very good. <laughs> uh, one of those areas that I think we found common ground on is the importance of competent legal representation for mm -hmm. families when they're under investigation. And last month I had the opportunity to go up to Waco and spend the day with the McLennan County Parent Advocacy Program, which you helped launch just a few months ago. And I was really impressed by some of the work they're doing. They let me do essentially a ride along um, in visiting some of their families and going to court with them. Tell our audience a little bit about this program and why you personally believe the right to counsel is so important to the system. Well, first, thank you for going to Waco um, and checking it out for yourself. It, it was very exciting and, it, and the programs funded by Casey Family Programs um, and Judge Coley um, is sort of leading or led that effort to get the program started. I think, and if I could step back, I was just recently talking with um, the Austin Stone Church and their um, foster care ministry and 
it was shocking to them to learn that parents don't automatically have that representation um, and to have to educate them on on what that the system looks like and so that's what makes this program so unique and so needed because families do need that that happens right at the investigative stage to give them the support the legal support that they need to help them navigate the system and also meet the requirements that could lead to removal if they don't um, have that representation and that support but i think also not only the legal representation that is so valuable another piece of this program that i don't think gets enough attention is the lived experience that comes with that there are families who have been in the system and come out of the system that also walk alongside that family to help them navigate and understand what they need to do to hopefully avoid any what we want is people to never meet us that, that's that's what the goal is is how do we help you so that you never come into the system and probably one of the more powerful moments is we were in the home of one of the families that they were helping and it was basically the last visit mm -hmm. that they were having from the investigator and we were sitting there on the couch and it was incredible how the presence of the attorney and their advocacy for that family and the mm -hmm. relationship quite frankly that the investigator and the attorney had built with each other really facilitated a lot of creative decision making mm -hmm. because you know this was one of those poverty is not neglect cases right and this family never got into the system yeah that kid was never removed but they got housing mm -hmm. they were able to find housing and it was really due to the fact that they had that attorney with them from the very beginning mm -hmm. and then the willingness of the investigator who was there to actually work proactively Absolutely. and productively with yeah. the attorney and with the family so it's a really impressive model and i'm it hopeful is. we can get it statewide yeah and i can only imagine how scary that has to be for someone who doesn't have that representation and doesn't have the resources to be able to fund it on their own and feels like the fight's already lost and that has to be really traumatic so another area we've discussed at length is the Child Abuse and Neglect Central Registry. And uh, for those unfamiliar with it, it's a database that the state runs that has the names of individuals who have been found to have reason to believe to have abused or neglected a child. And it's an important tool for us to have because obviously you don't want somebody who has done something terrible to a child in a job or working at a summer camp or doing anything where they have access to children and can potentially cause more harm. But like any system, there are always problems that need to be ironed out. And some of those areas with the registry, in our opinion, is you can actually be listed on the registry before you go to court and before you're adjudicated as actually guilty of having committed what you're accused of. And we know of cases and have actually at the foundation helped on cases where families have been ultimately acquitted, um, for lack of a better term, of the allegations against them. But they've remained on the registry because there's not an automatic removal process. They have to go through another set of appeals that can sometimes take years um, in order to get off the registry. So as commissioner, we've discussed ideas. What would you like to see changed with the way that the registry is run? So we could talk all day. Really about have, how yes. I feel and about I the registry. We have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, there are a lot of changes that I would like to see made. And some of those changes I could make in rule. But I think this is one where I I support legislative help because there there is an important change that I would like to see that I can't make. Um, and one of those is in Texas, you only either you did it or you didn't do it. And those are your only options you have those two options to your your appeal where I came from we have committees in every region. But there is one public person that's appointed I can't appoint a public person to a committee, but this gives people the opportunity to say i'm not that person anymore. I should be able to make my case and have myself removed. And they don't have that here in Texas. And I, I, the case that I think of is, you know, there was a young man who fully deserved his RTB when he, for what he did as, as a young person. He's 40 some years old, has had his granddaughter and wanted to adopt her. He's, ha he's had her for years and wants to finalize the adoption. He couldn't because he was on the registry, but there was a process he could go through 
to have his name removed so that we could allow that to happen. That should be here. You should also be able to go through your processes before you're put on that registry because the damage is done once you're there. Coming off of it does not undo if you lost your job or any, because now everyone knows at the very least you were accused, even if now you've been proven that you're innocent. And so I don't think we, we get the real impact it has on people's lives. And then I think there should be changes in how long you stay on it based on the severity. 99 years for no matter what it was is crazy. And then I think there should also be some authority that, look, for any of us that are parents, I only have one and I don't get it right a lot. Am I a danger to everyone else's kid? Even if I met the definition, am I a danger? There's a difference between intentionally harming or neglecting your child and sometimes things happen and there should be some room in there for who should be on that registry. Oh, I appreciate that. And we want to focus a little bit now toward the end of our program on prevention and preservation, which is becoming a huge issue. Um, and it's the direction really that the child welfare system is moving. And I think in 2008 was really the spark that pushed this culture change. Mm -hmm. Congress passes the Family First Prevention Services Act, which really changes how states use Title IV-E funds to run their foster care systems and now allows you to use those federal dollars to work on keeping kids out of foster care rather than just maintaining them once they come into the system. Can you give us an update on how Texas is moving toward implementation of Family First? Yes, yeah, so just as a reminder, Family First is to meet the substance abuse or mental health treatment needs um, for, for parents and other caregivers to keep their kids safe at home. The federal law requires that services must be evidence-based and approved by the National Clearing House. Without meeting this requirement, states cannot use federal matching funds um, for these services. The House Bill 3041 that was authored by Chair Frank, which leverages FF, I'm gonna get caught up with all my Fs, Family First Act funding <laughs> to provide substance abuse and mental health treatment um, intensive parenting skill training for parents whose children, but for these services, would end up in the foster care system. Um, we are partnering with the courts and with the SSCCs to implement this. And, I, and we, we just presented a bit about this um, at the House hearing that we had, but I think it's important to you to know that these evidence-based programs are expensive and currently not widely available throughout most of this state. Um, but our prevention and early intervention division funds a high quality network of these services, but they are limited and aimed at preventing abuse and neglect from occurring at all and are made available to the general public without the interference of government, which is important. Um, building out this network, though, is going to be a tremendous effort. Um, we are partnering with HHSC. Um, because they provide valuable services and have a valuable network as well. And so we are doing, we are trying to do the work that we have to encourage those providers um, and to make sure that those services are available. But there is a huge part of the state that don't have any services that are on that clearinghouse. Um, one set of services that are offered by PEI that is being revised to meet the FFPSA requirements is the provision of evidence-based home visiting or parenting education and support program offered to parents and children in the home outside of a clinical or classroom setting um, to our pregnant and parenting foster youth. Starting in September of this year, our pregnant and parenting youth will be offered FFPSA approved home visiting and DFBS will have a position dedicated to coordinating the provisions of these services um, and working with our CBC legacy um, partners to do this. And that service array, I'm glad you brought that up because it's so important mm -hmm. and you know, the discussions as 3041 was going through last session really kind of honed in on the fact that we have this federal clearinghouse that mm -hmm. in a lot of ways ties the hands of the states because yes. you can only go through things that they've reviewed and approved. Yeah. And at the time, I think there were, what, seven programs mm -hmm. op actually operating in Texas that were at that clearinghouse. So service capacity is a huge, huge issue. Um, 
where are we at with services right now? And what do you see as the most critical needs in terms of the services that we need in Texas? I think for those services that support mental health and substance abuse, I don't think there's anywhere we don't have a need. Um, for, for services that qualify for the clearinghouse, I don't know that we're in too much different a situation than we were a couple of years ago. I mean, the cost is, is a big driver for why, but we've got to do a better job of partnering with each other and with the community to see how we can support the development of these programs. And so I can't say that there's any one area, I would say the focus is on all of them um, in, in, in meeting the needs of our families. And when it comes to building up that service capacity, as I talk to providers, mm -hmm. one piece of feedback that I always hear is the licensing and regulatory environment can be difficult in Texas. And there's a perception that it is um, overly punitive at times and doesn't focus enough on actually helping providers improve the quality of services. What's your reaction to this feedback? And what do you think the department can do to make changes in how it approaches licensing and oversight of providers? So I hear it directly. Um, I take the time to meet with providers myself, and they are not shy. Um, and so I get it. Um, and I understand. And I think that there's there's legs to it. And there are times when I think sometimes we do take certain actions out of fear because of our current climate, um, wanting to make sure that you get it right so that it doesn't come back on you. But we can't operate like that. Um, you know, as far as licensing, I would leave that to to Commissioner Young to to address since licensing sits in HHSC. But she and I have a standing monthly call. We talk about these issues and how the two departments can be responsive and good partners to our providers um, and understanding where they're coming from. And we get it. We get it. We, we have to, when I sat down, so we, we pulled all of our, for instance, our child care investigators into a room and I met with them to say we cannot swing too far either way. You know, we have to be mindful of what's normalcy. When you're investigating, what is reasonable that should have happened here? We, if we're expecting perfection, we're, no one's gonna be able to stand up to that. We won't have providers or foster families if people can't make mistakes. Now, mistakes that lead to a child death, that's a whole different story. But there is a difference between just normal everyday and blatant disregard for taking care of someone. Um, and so we're trying to get our, get our staff to be mindful of the time that it takes when we show up. Can you coordinate those visits? You know, I get sometimes we have to make unannounced visits. But not every visit has to be unannounced and how does our presence disrupt how they're doing what whatever they're doing when we show up and they have to drop everything how better can we work with them can we coordinate all of these different visits for licensing for um just in general investigations for hide monitoring does it have to be someone different at every time and for some of those things are very descriptive or prescriptive and, and we have to do it this way. But I think there's room. Um, we also have regular calls about contract issues. And I think we're, we're, we've already tried to make some changes in our contracts and we're still looking at that and how we do oversight and penalties. And those are all very emotional topics for people. Um, and we're trying to show them that we hear them and we're trying to move where we can move. And you brought up foster families and all of the different people who are involved in the system and you know making sure that we're not running them off and yeah. I think that's an important point because. We always have to remember that this system doesn't work without thousands of Texans who are volunteering their time to serve these children and so for folks who are watching online or in the audience today who may want to get more involved, what are some ways that they can help. Well, I'm always going to say foster and adoption. <laughs> I mean, I have to, I have to, um, because that's where we need you. But if you choose to foster, mentor the bio family. Always foster with the intent of that child going home. Don't foster with the intent to adopt. That's wrong. That is just wrong. 
because you don't see the child if that's your intent. Um, we spend so much money on like 23andMe and everything because we want to know where we came from, where we belong. We don't see that with our kids. We expect them to be grateful, grateful that we took you in. Well, we just took you from everything you know. That's not grateful, that's traumatic. And we want to go back. No child wants to be in foster care. They wanna go home to the chaos that they know. That's just the reality of it. You know, but I realize that not everybody part to foster and to adopt. And so, well, and one last thing, if you are willing to adopt, consider an older child. We have so many older kids who age out of the system with no one to love them. Yes, many of them will go back home, but many will age out with no one and nothing. And a handful of classes don't prepare you to be a grown up. I'm still trying to be a grown up. I still call my mom now and ask for advice. I can't imagine not having her. And if we can imagine our kids being trying to navigate this world on their own, that's crazy. As well as a lot of our kids that age out to homelessness, to trafficking, to further abuse or worse. And so I just, just don't forget them. Um, and for those that, you know, to foster or to adopt is not what you're called to do, maybe be a mentor to that child. So there, this is where I go on my birthday. This is where I go on Christmas. This is who I call when I don't know what to do. Um, but I, I also wish we would, the way the church takes care of a family when someone dies, we need to do that upstream. That mom or dad or young family with three little ones that doesn't have the coping skills. And sometimes that stress that comes may lead to a response that normally wouldn't happen. Show up for our families to bring food, to watch the kids, to run errands, um, just to check in before they reach a crisis and then I get them. How do we show up for families and surround them and, and make it a safe place. So if your church or community has a foster care ministry, be part of that. Um, try to take care of that family so I never meet them. But do the same when families are reunified, help that stick. Or when people adopt, and now this is new, surround them with the same services so that it doesn't disrupt and those children come back into care. Um, I would also say, you know, we need your prayers this is hard you know this seat was on fire when i sat in it and people often give me gasoline and not water and then i get headlines i am not here for my own glory i don't take what i take because i want to be i can't do any of this without every single person Every per and none of this works without our providers and our caseworkers. This whole system falls. And so we need people to stand with us and not against us. I think you have graciously given me the opportunity to show we are not failing. I am not asleep at this wheel. I am giving everything I can to this job because I didn't put myself here and I'm gonna be accountable for how I do this job. And I see the kids and when I'm traveling to talk to staff, that's what I am saying to them. And I need everybody to not look at DFPS as a thing. This is a people business. Everything we do has real impact on the lives of kids. We cannot be caught up in a bunch of administrative tasks. We have to spend the time with children and have the freedom to do that and to be able to meet the individual needs of those kids and those families and it has to be a culture shift not just for dfps but for texas that kids need to stay with their families when they safely can and that we need to do everything we can to get them home when it is safe to do so when they can't stay and then adoption comes after that Well, thank you for that. And 
one final question before we let you go. Yeah. Um, you've been on the job for about two and a half years now, a little more. Um, what surprised you most about the job and what gives you hope for the future of the child welfare system in Texas? That I still have hair <laughs> is what has surprised me. I think all that we have endured, uh, three months into this job, we had a pandemic, we had a shutdown, followed by a significant loss of beds, a federal lawsuit, and a great resignation. And we have sustained this program even still. We have made the improvements we've made in spite of those things. One of those things is overwhelming. We manage them all at the same time. The child welfare system is a difficult job in a small state. Texas is a mini United States. And we manage that with all of those other things being thrown at us. And the staff that have stuck in here with me day in, day out, night after night and weekends, they are, they are heroes. Um, and so, you know, it has surprised me what all we've managed to come through and still show the positive data that we have. Um, and I think what gives me hope is like I said earlier, because I didn't put myself here. And if I'm trusting the Lord, then he will see us through this valley that we are in. And he will give me the wisdom and the discernment that I need to lead this department. My staff give me hope, the emails that I get from them, the comments that they make to me in the elevator and in the parking garage, that gives me the hope, the support that I get from the governor. You know, there are some members who have given me wise counsel that has been invaluable and some of their staff as well and who have been there for me um, since I got here. I can't ever ex express how all of those supports are what get me through this. Because um, I get my butt kicked <laughs> on a daily basis. And often I think people want people to think that Texas is so much worse. They don't want to share the positive things that are happening. And we, we don't rest in those positive things. Don't ever hear me say, because we're doing good, we don't need to, we will always need to improve. There are lives who depend on us doing better and better and better. But we get it right a lot. But that's not what gets talked about. Well, as Texans, we always like to brag about being Texans. And so I think you've pointed out that we've got the opportunity to show the country what it looks like to fundamentally transform a system and lead in that way. And I'm just very grateful for you to take the time to be here with us coming down um, and being willing to discuss some difficult as well as hopeful things. Join me in thanking Commissioner Masters for being with us today. I thought I might have cried or something. So.